Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I, I think we're ready to begin. And my job is a simple one, just to welcome you all to the uh, Design Conversations Lecture Series, uh, sponsored by the Vanilli Center for Design Studies. It's good to see you all, and it's great to have a, a full house here, as usual. Um, we have a couple of things to take care of before we start today. I just would like to announce that uh, one of our alums in graphic design, uh, Chris Bailey from Philadelphia, Bailey Design Group, has generously supporting our videotape documentation of the, of the lecture series. And so a big word of thanks to um, Chris Bailey. And uh, otherwise, I'm going to, at this point, uh, toss the ball to my colleague, Josh Owen, who will um, um, uh, pick up from here. Thank you, Josh. Thanks, Roger. Welcome, everybody. It's great to see such a, a packed house tonight for our exciting lecturers, who we're delighted made it through uh, difficult weather conditions to get here. Um, I'm going to take a few minutes to start off with to announce our 2015 RIT Industrial Design Glass Lab Design Fellowship Award. Um, a number of years ago, we did a cooperation with our friends uh, at the Corning Museum of Glass and our other friends in the, uh, the glass program here at RIT um, under the um, banner of the Vignelli Center in the Senior Studio Meta Project. And we had a wonderful time working together with Corning and with uh, artists and designers in the same cohort. We learned a lot about each other and about the medium. Turns out Corning is an incredibly forward-thinking company and they've organized uh, something which they call Glass Lab, uh, which exposes glass technology and hot glass uh, as a medium for rapid prototyping to architects and designers, and they're specifically interested in that. Um, they brought me down to do this Glass Lab uh, shortly after we completed the student collaboration, and I was so enamored by the experience that uh, I worked closely with them to set up a fellowship, which would be a sort of feeder to Corning, bringing young industrial designers uh, to go and do Glass Lab, which is essentially two days worth of working with master glass technicians in the rapid prototyping of design ideas. Uh, so in 2012, we had two students go down and do it. In 2013, we formalized the fellowship, and uh, David Strauss was the recipient. <laughs> Last year it was uh, Bridget Sheehan, uh, both of them grad students in ID. I think Bridget's here tonight somewhere. Bridget, are you here? Where are you? There she is. How was it? All right, there you go. <laughs> so um, the, uh, the Glass Lab Fellowship provides one RIT industrial design student, either a graduating senior or graduating grad student, with an opportunity to explore glass as a medium for rapid prototyping uh, in a two-day glass lab session at the Corning Museum of Glass at the end of May each year. In addition to the CMOG session, the student is eligible to receive transportation reimbursement, an overnight stay in a hotel in Corning, and a $500 honorarium, and public acknowledgments from both RIT and CMOG. The uh, criteria we've used for the selection of that student each year is that uh, the faculty are looking for exceptional design skills, excellent communication skills across mediums, such as verbal, drawing, etc., a high degree of maturity, and most importantly, a strong track record of meaningful contributions to the industrial design program at RIT in terms of service to the department. The award design um, was uh, done in a team several years ago together with myself, um, with a glass artist from the School for American Crafts, um, a uh, industrial design senior, and with Katie Nix, who's my colleague here in the Vignelli Center. Uh-oh. There we go. There should be another slide. Well, the other slide's not there, but I can tell you who the award recipient is. <laughs> 
So uh, the award this year goes to a graduating graduate student from industrial design who uh, to the faculty represented um, all the qualities that we look for. In addition to those qualities, we felt that this individual would benefit greatly from the experience in their career path. It was not an easy choice. It never, ever is. Um, this particular second year graduate class is uh, sort of a, uh, a wonder, a group of wunderkind, we say, um, of, uh, of uh, students from all over the world. Me all of them deeply passionate about industrial design. And interestingly, all of them twisted my arm into doing something like a glass lab with Corning last year. So they've all had an experience with a uh, glass lab already. Um, that said, there was one clear winner, and this year's award goes to Timothy Copeland. So come on up. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, enjoy it. So Corning will be in touch soon about the details. OK. I'll, All right. I'll keep my phone charged. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Exciting stuff. So, and now on to the, uh, the meat of the act here, so to speak. Uh, we are delighted to have Antenna Design with us tonight. Um, do you want me to open it, or should I? Just have to do it. Okay. Uh, Antenna Design New York was founded in 1997 by Masamichi Udagawa and Sigi Mosengler. Antenna's people-centered design work typically spans both physical and digital spaces, taking into account object, interface, and environment. In the public sector, Antenna has experience ranging from the design of New York City and Washington, D.C. subway cars to the automated ticket vending machines for the New York Metropolitan Transportation Authority. On the commercial side, Antenna works with technology companies to help them identify and design user-focused products and services. Antenna also has a close relationship with the office furniture company Knoll Incorporated, for which Antenna has been designing office systems since 2006. Antenna's work has won numerous awards, including the prestigious National Design Award in Product Design from the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum in 2008, and Antenna's Help Point Intercom for the MTA is included in the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Thank you for coming, and we, we welcome Antenna Design and are delighted that you're here today. Thanks. Thank you, Josh, for a nice introduction, and uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, being here and uh, inviting us over. Yeah, we are very happy to be here. We were here once before about more than 10 years ago, 12 years ago or so, so it's great to be back. Yeah, no, it's uh, good. Okay, <coughs> well, um, let's see. The time flies. Uh, it's been already over uh, 18 years since we started our studio, and uh, uh, we've been quite lucky to have a, a collection of very good uh, clients and the projects. And we'd like to talk about some of the projects and uh, uh, talk about what we were thinking with it. Um, we, we have a studio in New York City uh, in the far west Chelsea. And uh, being in New York is uh, quite a learning experience of its own. Um, there are lots of funny people, and um, uh, always interesting to observe, but more interesting to imagine what's happening in their heads, <laughs> which is a really important uh, part of the job for us because we believe the purpose of the design is to change the behavior of the people for the better. And uh, for that, we subscribe to rather old philosophy, which is called City Beautiful, that uh, one of the uh, Enlightenment movement uh, from 19th century, North American version, 
based largely on the city planning and the architecture. Um, the idea of City Beautiful is simply by making great urban space through the architecture and the monuments and the city planning, we can generate better behavior amongst the members of society. It's a very idealistic idea, but uh, going through quite a few public projects uh, with New York and DC, um, we came to believe this is really, or rather, we hope this is true, and uh, this is our sort of source of uh, energy to go forward. Um, one of our first um, projects in the public realm, or maybe the first project in the public realm, was to design uh, the ticket vending machine for the metro card, which is the card that gives you access to uh, the subways and the buses. And uh, that project actually um, started... Um, Late 90s, and the machine was introduced in 99. So you have to kind of uh, step back and imagine the past. It's uh, way before... Uh, iPhone or iPhone. any smartphone and uh, any way before the generation where everybody is using a touch screen. Um, also, automation back then uh, wasn't something that people embraced because a lot of public equipment has been in a bad condition, has been vandalized, malfunctioning. Uh, you saw a lot of things like this payphone, which you don't, you don't, you would not want to put your money in that. So this, uh, these machines just to eat your money. So, <laughs> so it was in that context that we had to come and uh, design a ticket vending machine that had a touch screen and that was placed in the subway environment, which is a very harsh environment, um, which uh, exposed to a lot of vandalism and also, as I said, a lot of skepticism towards uh, a machine. Also, as I mentioned, this was really before touch screens were per pervasive. Actually, when we thought the project, when the project started, we thought people must be familiar with ATMs because ATMs had, of course, touch screens already then. But it turned out that at the time, about 50% of the ridership of uh, New York City Transit uh, or of the MDA actually did not have a bank account. So they were completely in the cash economy. So they had no experience with a touch screen. When they, what they know about a screen is a television screen, and a television screen you're not supposed to touch. So again, this was something where we really had to shift people's behavior and embrace touch screen. Um, so then this is the machine, how it is um, in service, and it's been in service since 99, and is still going. There has not been any change to the hardware design or the screen interface design. And um, we're quite happy a few years ago, the MoMA had an exhibition called um, um, Talk to Me about interface design. And an actual working machine was uh, included in the gallery and people could go and buy. There was a special edition Metro card uh, at the event. And um, uh, it is really actually rare to see uh, uh, interface design that lasts this long. If you look nowadays, uh, websites and other user interfaces get redesigned every few years. So, um, and we think one of the reasons that it was, has been so successful is that we really tried to mimic a um, human dialogue with the machine. So each screen has a very limited set of information on it. There's one question per screen and then f a few answers. So you can very quickly hop from screen to screen. When we did that, initially, um, a lot of people were saying, well, why don't you put more stuff on one screen? Then you need fewer screens. But our uh, user testing showed that this was far faster because people remember the positions and they can just zip through the transaction. And also, we were able to tie together the screen interface and the physical the hardware interface um, through color coding because if you look at the machine itself, it's kind of a big machine and we could not change the component layout. So wherever cash receptacle was or uh, card entry and so on, all of that was given. So what we did is we grouped 
things that belong together with these um, kind of simple colored bezels. And so anything on the interface that has to do with cash is green and the, the cash uh, deposit bezel is green. Everything that has to do with uh, receipts or, or change, again, the instruction is red, the, the bezel is red and so on. That's uh, uh, another <laughs> equipment we designed for New York City subway. Um, it's just uh, the intercom. Um, so in case of emergency, uh, you should be able to find it easily. And uh, you can also ask about uh, the services uh, if you push the green button. Um, so it needs to be super visible because it is supporting the emergency situation if it happens. But uh, at the same time, we didn't want to make the machine look so alarming. Then people are constantly reminded that there is uh, imminent danger around, uh, which is not quite comfortable because such thing um, luckily doesn't happen too often. But nevertheless, uh, we have to make it visible and recognizable. So we took a cue uh, from uh, more of the street light. So it has very skinny, uh, nice to live with the presence. So people don't need to freak out all the time. Just on a side note, this, this uh, device was designed already in uh, 2004. And uh, um, as Josh mentioned, it was included in MoMA's permanent collection, but it only actually started being implemented uh, about two years ago. Right? Um, so you can also see that working with public authorities, sometimes you have to be very patient. We, we actually thought oh, at one uh, Always. <laughs> 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 so we actually at one point thought this is, this is you know, this has, is gone, it's not happening. And uh, because often there are leadership changes and then priorities change. And uh, so we were very, very happy when the program came back and uh, now you have it pretty much in every station. And if a station doesn't have it yet, then it will get it shortly. Actually, we need patience with uh, uh, all projects, <laughs> not just for the public project. Um, after the mach uh, vending machine, we were now asked to design the train. Um, and this is uh, the first train we designed, uh, started running in 2000 uh, for New York City. Uh, it's uh, the inside of the train. The one thing we understand about the public space is the importance of the safety. That's uh, the most important design criteria. And uh, if we could help reduce the crime or other uh, petty crimes uh, through the design, that's uh, really a good thing. One thing we thought about is uh, bad things tend to happen in the darkness. So we try to achieve uh, extra brightness in the interior. Um, that was done through the color scheme. As you can see, it has shiny black floor and the bright uh, wall and the ceiling. That this contrast generated uh, the the feeling of expanding space. Not only it's bright, but uh, it felt uh, much larger. Um, the other point, uh, the, uh, the other detail I'd like to point out is uh, at uh, the end of the seat, you see somewhat decorative looking diagonal bars there, but uh, it's not for ornamentation. We worked with uh, uh, NYPD and they told us there are quite a few incidents uh, when train pulls into the platform, uh, station platform, and the door opens. And someone on the platform reaching into the car and uh, snatching necklace or handbag or just simply attacking for fun. And they asked us to provide uh, some ways to pro uh, protect it protect the passenger. 
Um, first, we had uh, a different style. Uh, we proposed the breadproof grass, the large breadproof grass, which keeps things transparent. But uh, uh, the emerging vandalism back then, and still continues, that is uh, scratching, uh, scratchity sometimes it's called. It's really artless form of vandalism, and if we provide a large sheet of grass, it becomes the perfect target for them. So we moved to stainless steel bars. It's easy to maintain. But originally, they were arranged horizontally. And uh, when we looked at it, it looked more like um, um, ladder. And if something looks like ladder, then the people will use it as such, especially kids. So if train design encourages kids to climb up and down the ladder, and uh, maybe get injured, that's our responsibility. So we made it diagonal to simply not to send the invitation. So by being diagonal, of course, physically, kids can still go up, but uh, it's not sending the, that message. This is a subsequent fleet also for New York City. Uh, New York City has different divisions. Uh, that goes back to the time when the subways were operated by uh, various competing companies, so there's not one standard. And um, when we did uh, this, this uh, fleet, we also had the opportunity <coughs> to design a fully digital um, uh, strip map. Uh, and that's, again, something very important for New York City because very often trains don't go where they're supposed to go. <laughs> so you sit on a train, you think you're going to your destination, and suddenly you look out the window and you're in a different stop. Um, and that happens because trains get rerouted or there are service changes because of repairs. Um, so with these maps, the uh, operator can put in the correct program and uh, make sure that customers know exactly uh, where the train is going and whether it's stopping where they need to stop. And that, again, helps people reassure themselves in, in their trip and makes them more calm and we think that makes them less prone to vandalism. After the success in New York City, we were invited to design the new fleet for Washington DC Metro. Uh, obviously that's a rendering. <laughs> um, at uh, the interior uh, bars I view. And here you can see it has a rather different layout than New York City. New York City has all longitudinal benches. Here we have mostly transverse seats. Um, so every city has different preferences in terms of how they want to accommodate their people and what kind of layout fits best. DC has um, more, um, uh, yeah, above, first of all, more above ground um, uh, area and also the, um, Rides are sometimes longer. Oh, it's a bit of a hybrid between commuter rail and the urban transit. Yeah. So people prefer the transverse seating. Then you can see um, here we actually were able to do these glass seat ends, which we already wanted to do in New York. And so one of the nice things in DC was that uh, people behave a little bit better there. It's not quite as harsh of an environment. So we were able to do <laughs> things we couldn't do in New York such as the glass seat ends, and also the seats themselves are <coughs> upholstered, so they're a little bit soft. The first train set started the test run uh, last year uh, in January, and uh, it's uh, scheduled to start passenger service uh, in a month or so. So you can see very much like our concept design realized. Then this is one of our latest projects. In fact, it is still ongoing as we speak. Um, I'm sure you've noticed that uh, public pay phones are almost um, dying. I mean, hardly anybody is using them anymore because most people have their own cell phones. Um, and uh, for example, in New York City, there's so many payphones that don't work anymore or they are in very bad condition. So New York City decided that when the 
their existing franchise contracts with the different companies that were running, the pay phones, uh, ran out. They would put out a bid for a new type of communication structure that will replace all the pay phones in New York City. And so we were hired by a company, a new consortium actually of different companies called CityBridge. And uh, with the help of our design, they won the franchise contract. And so now, uh, over the next uh, several years, there will be up to 10,000 of these units deployed. Uh, throughout New York City, including all boroughs. So again, this will have a quite big presence in the kind of cityscape. So it was very important for us to come up with a design that's uh, instantly recognizable, so people can easily find one of these stations. But at the same time, these will be out there for many years and they have to go into different neighborhoods and different contexts. So it's important to design something that has the appropriate civic feel and that is timeless enough. Um, so we came up with this kind of uh, slim, <coughs> tall structure and uh, it has essentially three sides. Two sides have large displays for advertising and public service announcements. And by the way, these structures are entirely funded by advertising. So the city is pay, doesn't pay anything. On the contrary, every year they get a certain percentage of the ad revenue from the franchisees. Um, and then the um, skinnier side has a small touch screen. So this is sort of the more personal interactive area uh, for the public where they can still make phone calls if they need to. Um, and um, they can also uh, do a host of other things such as they can plug in their uh, cell phones to recharge. Um, they can call up local information uh, on a touch screen. They can do video call. And um, the structure itself is actually a Wi-Fi hotspot. So it will also create kind of a coverage all over the city so that people have Wi-Fi access anywhere. This, uh, the device on the, on the right hand side is a version without the advertising screens because these um, units also go into residential areas where s advertising is not permitted and not desirable, so they don't have those screens on the side. And here's a close up. So, for nine if you have to make a 911 call, you just have a single button. Um, otherwise, you have a, an interface that's fully ADA um, uh, compliant. And um, also, this is a kind of an open platform, so there is the potential to do a lot of new things, which we don't know yet. But uh, in the course of time, uh, it will become more evident for what this thing all can be used for. Um, also, the shape, uh, as you can see, it's sort of monolithic, but then it has a, a kickback at the bottom, and that's, that is really to articulate the interactive side. So it gives orientation to the, to the device and people always know which is the side to walk up to um, for, for their personal interaction. And it also creates a little bit of a more private zone because if you are making a call, you don't want, you obviously want to have a bit of privacy. And as you can see, there's no handset. So calls will be either speakerphone calls or since nowadays so many people walk around with their own headsets, you can just plug in your own headset. So hopefully there will be maybe up to 300 by the end of the year, and then they will be continuously rolled out. Before getting into the public space, um, we used to work in San Francisco Bay Area, and uh, uh, we've been working quite a bit on so-called high-tech products. But wow, this sounds so dated now, but anyway. Uh, one of our long, uh, great clients is uh, Bloomberg LP. Uh, Bloomberg is, as you, some of you may know, it's a real-time financial information service company, but uh, they do make their own hardware to enhance the usability and the performance of the software, but also it is part of the, the brand uh, communication effort a uh, great thing about software is it's flexible and uh, you can do all kinds of things, but uh, once you turn off the machine, everything disappears. So they won't have um, 
their own branded hardware, which has a permanent presence in the trading floor and offices. Also, their uh, equipment is not sold, it's leased, which means they are responsible for <coughs> maintaining it. And so we were able to use materials that, at least at that time, were not as common for, for um, computer products, such as aluminum, steel, um, and um, we looked at it a little bit more, like almost a little bit more like for office furniture in that sense. So it has a timeless presence. These these uh, screens are uh, around for quite some time, unlike um, consumer screens, which you know they are there for a few years and then they are gone. This is uh, uh, again for Bloomberg LP. Uh, it's uh, the secure access device based on the fingerprint scanning. That was introduced already quite some time ago, and uh, back then the fingerprint scanning was seen with a little bit of fear. Uh, it inspired the sort of Big Brother uh, issue. So to encourage people to use this secure device, um, which advantage people understand rationally, but uh, emotionally they have little fear. So we had to use a design to change that fear uh, into something cool that uh, people are willing to do. So we intentionally took this sort of a card form factor, which looks like a very expensive card for exclusive club or something. So using this thing, you know, flipping out from uh, the pocket, and using this thing is something cool. It's almost a bit like James Bond. Right? So uh, this is something people are willing to do and show off, even. Other terminal uh, we designed for Bloomberg uh, it's uh, physically very flexible that can kind of embodies the, the brand message and the functionality. And then in 2006, we were approached by Noll and if we were interested in designing an office system. And of course, we were like, Noll, wow, you're so impressed. We're so big fans of all the classics of the Saarinen, the toy. Uh, Florence Knoll's work and Mies van der Rohe's work. So we were like super thrilled. And uh, but Knoll asked us to design an office system. And uh, office systems, um, even today, but more so in 2006, were predominantly these uh, cubicles or cubicle landscapes. And um, um, as you know, there are a lot of jokes have been made about cubicles, and this is a, a still from. Um, uh, Shaktati's uh, playtime. Um, many Dilbert jokes have been made about cubicles. And um, so, Anol didn't want us to do a cubicle system, actually. They wanted us to look at uh, more of an open plan system. And um, so, we thought, okay, <clears throat> we really like Noll's staff. And, um, and Noll has done office systems in the past, too. Not it's not just the, the sort of classics that we know, but we actually looked into the archives, and uh, this was one of the pictures we found. It was a design, I mean, an interior design by Florence Knoll for Millikan's headquarter in Midtown uh, Manhattan. Um, and uh, we thought, wow, why can't office furniture look like this today? Because we thought this is really stylish. Notice the ashtray on every desk. <laughs> and the rotary <laughs> telephone, of course. <laughs> so so we, we really set out to do an office system that felt like it was, uh, first of all, that it felt like it was uh, making use of Noel's heritage um, that we admire so much, uh, but also in contrast to a lot of the of office systems, which you don't really perceive as furniture. They are just these panels and, um, and walls. Uh, we wanted to do something that also looks, looks like furniture, but has, of course, the performance required of a systems product. And then um, uh, after the four years of uh, struggle, <laughs> so you have to be patient, <laughs> um, 2010, um, the system came out. 
uh, named Antenna Workspaces, and uh, it's a flexible uh, office system based on the desks and uh, or desking system and the storage components. And uh, on the desk, um, of course, an important aspect is sort of the structure. I mean, it's what makes a desk. And so we were contemplating many different structures and we were wondering, well, what, I mean, there's so many desks out, how, what should we do? And uh, as we were thinking, um, we uh, came up, we came across uh, elevated highway. Uh, and we saw, okay, on the highway, you always have your verticals and then you have the horizontal. And uh, they don't intersect, which means it can go as long as it needs to be. And also the placement of the legs is very flexible. And you can have a narrow highway or you can have one with many lanes. So we thought, okay, maybe this is a good structural concept or a starting point for a good structural concept. But then we still needed to come up with some way of connecting the verticals and the horizontals. And there, uh, another item uh, was a kind of source of inspiration, which are these V blocks, which we use in the model shop, where whatever you drop in, it self centers um, and stays in place. And this became sort of the, the basis for this connecting piece of our, uh, our horizontal rail and our vertical U shaped leg. Uh, we call it the cradle, and it makes a very, very strong connection. What you also see is our horizontal rail is, it's a square tube, it's actually a off, it's, it's a stock, stock type of tubing, but we rotated it, rotated it 45 degrees, uh, so it looks like a diamond, which uh, first of all made it easier to attach things to, but also it gave it a particular identity without having to add anything. So then this structural concept allowed us to have a very slender leg uh, in sort of reference to Florence Knoll's one inch square tubular leg on, on most, many of her furniture. And um, the structure also lends itself very well to uh, attaching things, hanging things from the structure, making very large top spans, being able to easily mount things upwards from the structure and then make easy connections for returns. And with um, uh, a limited kit of parts, we can start building large sort of multi uh, workstation desktops or benches. Um, in the middle on this one, you can see a sort of large beam. This is, this is actually not there for structural reasons, but it is there. Uh, to give us attachment points for, we can mount, um, we can mount uh, storage boxes, we can mount screens, I mean divider screens as well as um, uh, video screens, um, platforms, etc. And at the bottom, we can mount uh, the modular power uh, harnesses, and um, um, from there we, we mount um, cable management trays. So a bunch of storage components, they are designed to help certain behaviors, new behaviors needed for the open space, open planning. People need to change the behavior when they moved from a closed cubicle to the open work environment, which is uh, by default more social. You are together with your coworkers and uh, everyone's visible. So you have to modify how you behave. You can't just uh, uh, kick back in your cubicle and hiding from uh, others. So one of the elements we came up with is this, uh, uh, as you can see on the sketch, this L, which is a, a tower that provides a corner. And uh, it provides a corner which sort of describes the boundaries of your space. So it, even on an open desk, it articulates each person's space, and it also ma makes it, suggests that invisible boundary, and so if somebody comes up, they can just sort of knock on your cabinet instead of walking right up and looking over your shoulder, which is very uncomfortable. So again, you can see the storage elements are used to either 
create enclosure or create continuity. Um, then this is a, um, a, reception, a reception desk, desk set up, which is very approachable from uh, the guest stand and the point of view. But uh, for the person sitting behind the screen, it feels very protected. The mobile whiteboard, which works really like mobile whiteboard. It moves around, but it's very stable when you try to write it, which didn't exist until we came up with this one, surprisingly. Um, and so after the, the office system, NOR basically asked us to look into areas that are uh, a little bit more free, freely programmed, areas that are between, let's say, uh, the function of a conference room and the personal workstation because people more and more are working in these interstitial spaces and they need some support to allow this work to happen. So this is a kind of uh, hybrid stool desk, um, a little bit reminiscent of an old school uh, setup, uh, but it was completely driven by this new need of people walking around with their tablet computers all the time and they need a small surface to put it down or a small laptop. Um, and uh, this tool allows them to do that, but it also allows you to sit any way you want. You can sit, you can use it uh, like a traditional chair, you can use the, the upper platform as a kind of uh, uh, armrest, or you can use it as a support for your laptops. And then it's easy to pull a few of them together. Then we expanded this line with a few other elements. And uh, so you can see how pieces of furniture like that sort of support and suggest quick casual meetings. And then of course, in any quick casual meeting nowadays, since there's always technology involved, you need power. So you can see here, this on a picture, this pole, is, is to bring power in the middle of the space. Um, so, so basically we came up with this, which involve, uh, evolved into a larger program, but it started out just as a pole that brings power down. But then we realized, okay, we can create certain accessories around that pole or certain mounting uh, features to expand that to be more than just a power conduit. And then we also thought, well, we can actually put two of them together and then um, uh, make a divider, which can be a marker board or other writable surface. So a bunch of, of uh, accessories that can go in there. And then we thought, well, we can actually attach multiples together and really make this into dividers to create and define spaces in an open plan layout. And that can be more closed or more open depending on what type of space you want to create. And it sort of introduces a new flexible form of office planning. And that's uh, the first light that we designed. Uh, it's called the Spiral, and it uses uh, LED. Um, we wanted to focus on the light itself and uh, keep the supporting structure to bare minimum. So you can see the sort of head floating in the air that looked sort of like uh, a bird patching on a wire. That's where the name Sparrow uh, came from. The wire frame is actually not just uh, being structure, it, con it, it conducts the electricity to the head. And the base has a minimum footprint that uh, doesn't take up much space uh, from your desk. Uh, it's uh, the top view of the head. Uh, it looks like a uh, sundial, and uh, it's actually the radiator, meaning the, the heat uh, dissipation device. The LED gets really hot, so it is, it's very important to cool it efficiently, otherwise it will just uh, die. Um, all electrical components are housed in the handle, uh, which also has uh, the dimmer switch conveniently located. Uh, recently, the, we saw the article. It says the sitting is a new smoking. Uh, well, we don't, we, we don't 
agree with that, but uh, uh, journalism, uh, journalists sometimes try to uh, stir up the discussion. Um, but uh, it is a good thing to move around. Um, keeping yourself in a particular position all day is certainly not heresy. Uh, and certainly the certain job requires you to be at your workstation for a long time. So it is good to have um, the desk which can go up and down and uh, allows you to change your posture uh, throughout the day. Uh, so we designed this, it's called the uh, telescope. Uh, Again, for NOR. Uh, for NOR. And um, it's, it has telescoping legs, so we call it tel telescope. It's quite obvious, but... Uh, <laughs> um, again, we try to make it more furniture than the machine. Uh, lots of um, height adjustable desks are out there, including this guy. And uh, from our observation, um, they tend to celebrate the mechanism. Thus, it becomes look like a machine. But we don't want to work with a machine. We want to work with furniture. I mean, if we are to spend so much time with it. Uh, the other part is uh, the cable management, um, which is kind of a, a nuisance when you try to uh, move your work surface up and down because all the cables have to travel together. So that's uh, where we spend quite a bit of time to make it, uh, we can't make it disappear, but uh, uh, managed. And again, there are lots of systems or products which does cable management, but uh, not too well. Um, the lots of care man management uh, products are hard to use, so often people use it, I and mean, people do it once, but uh, you know, electronic products, you have to swap around. So the second time, they don't use the cable manager anymore. So to make it easy to use is very important. Yeah, so you can see, uh, as we made it easy to manage the cables underneath the table, and then uh, we have a plate that closes everything and keeps it neat and clean. Again, if it's easy to do, people will do it. If not, people will make a mess. How are we doing time-wise? Good? Okay. That was introduced uh, last, last year. year. Some, uh, yeah. Sometimes... So <laughs> <laughs> sometimes... Um, we also do projects outside of uh, the commercial context, not for clients, but uh, for museums or galleries. Um, these projects give us the opportunity to explore a topic that we are interested in uh, personally and that we want to um, make an experiment around. Um, this was a project um, where we were invited to make, we, we basically were designing uh, an exhibition an art exhibition on uh, video art about performance and surveillance from the 60s to the present time. And as part of that exhibition, the curator also asked us to, to make a piece for the exhibition itself, um, a kind of intervention, we chose to make a kind of intervention. And um, the intervention was inspired by the fact that we often watch or observe people who have dogs um, and how the dog act as a catalyst for uh, social exchange and meeting people. So because the dogs gather, people have to start to talk to each other. And sometimes um, that can be a little bit odd because if you don't want to speak to somebody but your dogs are, are socializing, you have to do it too. But sometimes people have dogs precisely for that reason. So we found that an interesting topic and we thought, well, what can we do uh, that makes use of this uh, principle? So what we did is we made an installation with four stools that invited people to sit down. Remember, it was a video, art video show, so we figured those art videos can be a little bit exhausting to watch. Let's give people a, a place to sit down. But uh, each stool had a camera embedded. And so this is ha what happens when you sit down. The camera starts taking your picture. And it takes the picture from a very odd angle, which means the photos are very unflattering. Nobody looks good on those pictures. <laughs> and those pictures, once one, more than one person starts sitting down, the images are starting to make contact. 
they will visit each other, they have different behaviors, they can be a little bit shy, or they can dislike each other, then they repel, or they dance with each other. So you never know what your image is going to do with other people's images. And that can be a little bit embarrassing, certainly. Um, so then people feel like they should say something to the other person whose image they are making contact with. And so we felt this was kind of a nice way to uh, get people, get strangers, to talk with each other in, in a kind of museum or gallery context where people are usually very serious and quiet. And kids are always the best audience for these types of installations because they just play with it and they try to test the system and they try and they often interpret more into it than there really is. So we like kids in installations. <laughs> At uh, uh, another so somewhat experimental uh, project uh, which we installed uh, in the show window of uh, Bloomingdale's uh, in the midtown Manhattan, we were given the opportunity to take over the entire the facade for, uh, for three weeks. And we installed uh, large neon flowers, which are electronically controlled and responding to the movement of uh, passers-by. So when the sensor uh, sees the presence, the, it turns on the flower, and then it's too loud, so. and then it fades out. But uh, since the passersby is uh, just uh, walking down the sidewalk, uh, they turn on one by one. Sometimes uh, people don't pay attention, but it becomes sort of, uh, you know, in, uh, sort of like an actor, uh, which is funny to observe. <coughs> That's a good guy, just turning everything on. So for duration of the installation, it totally transformed the street. Uh, the, it became sort of like a theater uh, with uh, audience and uh, accidental actors. <laughs> And again, the kids were the best uh, participants. And they thought the, actually the flower is responding to you, their dance move for some reason. So they are jumping up and down and try to invoke the new the actions. Uh, it's all happening in their head. That's and the, while these previous two installations were temporary, uh, we also uh, won a competition for a permanent installation in one of the new subway stations. And um, there the challenge was, they told us, we have to make something that has to last 100 years and uh, with minimal maintenance. So this was turned out to be quite a challenge uh, because even though we, we actually won this project as artists, not as designers, we, it was very much a design project uh, to really think about what can we do, how can we do it, and still maintain our underlying uh, um, intention, which was to give people something that hopefully, as they rush through the station, may puts a smile on their face, so makes them sort of, for a moment, think of something else. And so we ended up with this curtain of um, flowers that's hanging from the ceiling, and um, it's static, it doesn't do anything, but because of the layering and because people in this space are in constant motion, it actually feels animated. There's a little bit of a parallax effect. And um, the, the way the flowers are attached, um, they actually have a little bit of flexibility. So, because we were told, okay, if somebody comes with a hockey stick and hit, hits it, it has to survive. If somebody comes with a baseball and throw it up there, it has to survive. So it actually can uh, give a little bit um, but at the same time, it feels very immaterial, very light. It's, a, it's not an obvious piece, and a lot of people we heard who use the station a lot, they didn't notice it at first. But to us, that's fine, because you know, 
you have many, many years to enjoy it, and it shouldn't be something that you see and then it works on your nerves. So it's a very kind of subtle piece, but uh, we hope it sort of brings a smile in people's, in, on people's faces. And uh, the, the choice for the flower came from the fact that this area was an area that when the Dutch came to, to Manhattan, or that area, it wasn't called Manhattan then, um, uh, called this area Blomendal, Valley of the Flowers. And it is also located between Riverside Park and Central Park. So we use the flower theme as, as the theme for the installation. And with that, I say thank you. Thank you. I think we have some time for some questions, if there are any from the audience. Yes. Uh, I'm just curious to know who your design heroes are. Ah, quite a few. <laughs> uh, certainly Binelli, we'll say. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, Castiglione, we are big fans. And all obvious ones, the Corbe, Mies, um, Florence Nord, um, Maria Bellini, Dieter Rams, they are all I mean, they're, they're great architects and designers and artists. We are constantly learning. And, yeah. Yes. Can you say a few words about the dynamic between the two of these and how it's changed over the years in your design? Aha. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, I would say in the beginning we were fighting a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> now we can do this thing <laughs> peacefully. <laughs> um, well, it, uh, maybe a couple of things. The, in terms of uh, the skill sets that Sigi uh, handles more ephemeral things, I tend to do more mechanical things. And, uh, but uh, we learned over the, the years, um, fairly quickly actually, that uh, designing as sort of a team, I mean, uh, design process as a dialogue, that was a, a quite a sort of good dis discovery. It made things much quicker uh, because we don't have so the formality, and uh, we can just uh, toss so the unbaked uh, idea to the other side and uh, get quick reaction. It's a it's cut off, <laughs> or oh, it may be it may be interesting. So that uh, sort of speed of uh, hindsight, the feedback that was really. Again, the good discovery, uh, we didn't know that. And uh, to this date, that's been probably our strengths. Yep. What advice would you give to the emerging designers in this room? Be patient, very important. And um, uh, this is something I was told by Bill Mogridge. Um, be optimistic and uh, opportunistic. Um, that has quite a few implications. Uh, optimistic, to be a designer is one particular uh, occupation or job or lifestyle. That, uh, that needs optimism, as we mentioned in the beginning, this uh, city beautiful. <laughs> when if I hear that when I was a design student, I might have said, well, nonsense, it's just too idealistic. But now I firmly uh, believe that, I mean, I won't believe. Uh, that type of optimism is really needed to drive uh, the project. And also being opportunistic is very important. Um, when we, or when I s started design work, um, I wanted to do certain thing, but uh, that particular opportunity didn't come out, but something else came up. 
And uh, as long as you do the opportunity in front of you as best as you can, then until you succeed, that will open up the next door or the, that will give you next opportunity. It may not be something, again, that you really want to do, <coughs> but uh, as you keep doing the best job with each opportunity, the new opportunities are coming. And uh, one day you may get to do what you've been dreaming about, but most likely you change your mind <laughs> because you went through so many interesting things and uh, you change now what you want to do. So <laughs> it's a very kind of interactive thing. Uh, so I would say uh, optimis uh, being optimistic and opportunistic is a very important thing. And then another sort of more practical thing is um, get your work out there. People have to see your work. If it's just in your portfolio, and nobody knows. And nowadays you have so many more options on getting your work seen. Uh, but that was, I think, very important for us. And, and when we started, it was before all this kind of internet blogs and, and ample opportunities. But uh, we really tried to, um, we participated in this design competitions and sent in stuff and really tried to, to get our work out there in front of people. Yeah, no, no. Publish or perish. That's uh, <laughs> that's what uh, my my teacher, Mike, my, Mike McCoy, at Cranbrook uh, told us. So. Yes, another question. I'm, I'm teaching a class here, actually, in the industrial design department. I'm collaborating with uh, Kelly over here in the graphic design department um, in interaction. She teaches interaction design, and so we're heavily focused on. Um, collaboration and trying to talk about people in, um, uh, engaging with other disciplines. I'm wondering if you could have talked to our, st our students here about um, how collaborating with other disciplines has played a role in, in your work. Sure. Um, I think uh, the industrial design or design, graphic design, uh, design uh, is a, has an inevitably collaborative effort. Um, I mean, we are more into the industrial design, but uh, it's a uh, part of uh, commercial activity, part of uh, uh, cycle, and uh, because our output is our output is mass-produced object that can't happen just by ourselves. So we work with industry, that means we work with, of course, engineers, uh, marketing folks, sales guys, company executives who want to project their vision or and put uh, their capital into this endeavor. So working together with many different uh, disciplines is uh, given. And uh, many times also, for example, in the public projects, we have to work also with the people who are in maintenance, who have to deal with the things that we designed for many years and we have to hear. So we have to listen to a lot of people and we have to respect the um, knowledge and experience and expertise other people have, even if that's not always what we want to hear. And there's some things you know, we want to do and then somebody comes and says you can't do it because X, Y, Z, but if they are right, they are right. And we have to respect it and we have to find a middle ground or a, a way that works for everybody. Sure, because you do a lot of like design around digital displays. So, is there any way that you like um, allow for the change in firmware or um, user interface stuff like that? Um, yeah, I mean, for for on-screen stuff, of course, it's much easier to update something. But uh, things that are tightly packaged, it's kind of hard to predict. But for example, the um, the um, this uh, Link NYC, the sort of successor of the payphone. I mean, that is design, so it's uh, first of all very um, easily to maintain, but also everything that, that um, is inside could be swapped out for other components. And that's, I mean, that's very, that's largely the, the um, um, effort of the engineering team on it, but uh, it, 
this is, for example, something that's designed to be upgradable and uh, expandable also because this is kind of a new thing. And we don't, again, as I said before, we don't know yet what it actually all will do because you can suddenly embed sensors in this thing and it can measure air quality in different parts of the city. It can uh, be a, a weather um, station. It can uh, observe the environment and count how many people are passing by at what time of the day and so on. So these are other data gathering, gathering centers, but um, um, none of that is really known yet what will happen. So things can go in there and, um, and the, the structure is designed to allow for that. And uh, like, uh, as simple as the office furniture, uh, we have done a few. Um, you still need uh, like power and the data and uh, there, uh, the lifespan or life cycle of the furniture and the sort of a more technical bits like power and the data, they are very different. So if you integrate them, you are prematurely shortening the life of the furniture, which has much longer uh, lifespan. So there we don't in integrate, but uh, we provide a way to flexibly accommodate different type of, uh, sort of technical needs. So there are different ways to go about. We can't really future proof, <laughs> but uh, uh, we try. I think when I first started out, I really wanted to do furniture, and then I didn't have the opportunity until many, many years later. And uh, I mean, office furniture is very different from residential. I, I wanted to do residential stuff early on, and then, but somehow I never had the opportunity. But now, nowadays, and kind of as Masamichi said, also the things that you're interested in change because of what you have done already and what you have seen and what you have been exposed to. So. Um, I think now we are, um, or I, I am at least, um, much more interested uh, in things that where I can see they really affect yeah, people's behavior and what people do. Uh, we also, some, some of the work that we're doing, we cannot really show because it's confidential, but uh, we've been working in the healthcare realm quite a bit. And that's really kind of exciting to see how through design we can help people, for example, adhere more to a certain therapy which um, ultimately helps them, but we all know it's hard to stick to certain things that, that are not so pleasurable to do. So, so this has changed a lot, I find. Okay. Um, back in 87, when I first got my first job uh, in Japan at uh, Yamaha, they used to make system furniture, a system furniture for residential use. And I didn't know much about system furniture. I just thought that's really Bauhaus y and uh, uh, sounds interesting. So, uh, and I was luckily accepted. But then um, I was uh, assigned to design the musical instruments, totally different, uh, electronic musical instruments. And, uh, but as I started doing that, I saw that's really cool. And uh, then, uh, back in the yeah, mid 80s, uh, this, this school I went eventually, the Cranbrook, they had the, what's called the product semantics workshop, uh, which I'm not going into the detail, but uh, the outcome was published in Japan and throughout the world. I saw some of them, I got so fascinated by it. I had to go to that school, and I went, and I stayed in this country. Uh, then, many, many years later, finally, in 2006, we got to do, I mean, I got to do the system furniture, but went through a completely different route that, uh, well, I, did, I couldn't imagine anything, but, uh, and at that time, the system furniture is not something I, necessarily wanted to do, but uh, it was yet another great opportunity. And um, so, <laughs> it, it goes. <laughs> Sacrifice your initial design and make something that's more practical? 
that decision was kind of made for us. <laughs> so we initially had a, a glass panel at the end, and then, and it even was approved at first, and only quite some time later, uh, it became, I mean, the transit authority just felt that this is too much of a liability because of the scratchiti becoming very popular. And even if somebody, if somebody scratches a profanity into the glass, that's a reason they have to take the train out of service. And then we learned about the workers are allowed only to carry so and so much weight, which means one glass panel has to be handled by two workers. And it has all these implications that we didn't know. So, so then the, the, the transit authority decided that they don't want to have the glass panel. But also, uh, that this is something we learned over the time. Um, if something's so complicated to uh, maintain, and if, it, if something costs so much to operate, uh, we think it's not good design. The good, good design should be appropriate to that environment, the circumstance. So even if we like certain things, that may not be good for that particular uh, application. And uh, with that, we started thinking uh, family, uh, so less is more is really a good thing if you can achieve the same thing with less things. It's more elegant. Maybe not the shape, not the form, but as existence, it's more elegant. There was a sort of a uh, bidding process that called for proposal. It wasn't design uh, competition or anything. You know, typical sort of a design project uh, put together the, um, the proposal, the process, budget, so and so forth. I actually got it. Um, and we did, uh, I think, good job in so. <laughs> <laughs> that continue to the next <laughs> next one. Um, I think we will probably have to wrap up now. But before people get up, um, I just want to thank you both for a fantastic and inspired conversation, and thank you for making the world a better place with design. <laughs> You all get up. Uh, we want to invite you up to the industrial design spaces on the fourth floor for a pizza party. So please join us and eat something and, and have some time to further the conversation with Antenna. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Uh,